I'm gonna do the intro once again for the lovely people over at YouTube. So I'm gonna say hi everyone and <laughs> welcome. My name is Tech and uh, this is Bounty Thursdays. You can't just imagine how worried I was. How worried I was when the audio broke down. I mean, that's not something that makes me happy. Uh, at least now it's working. So whew, that was a uh, first. It was like, uh, uh, yeah, I wasn't enjoying that at all. But now we're up and running. That's all good. Um, I'm awfully sorry for that. What? We're going to kick it off again. So today we're going to talk a little bit about news and updates. And maybe you've been like me, you have been uh, seeing your Twitter uh, feed or, or newsletter or whatever, or, or ordinary news seeing anything about uh, the situation in Ukraine. And that is stressful for everyone. So if you're feeling bad about that, that's cool too. Um, there's I don't want to take any signs in any kind of way, but I feel sad for all the hackers in uh, in Russia that didn't have anything to do with the regime that now can't use Hacker One and other resources. I understand sanctions. I think that's a good way to deal with it. But um, there's always going to be people getting caught up in things. So uh, let's not discuss that. We're going to move on to uh, the next thing and the thing that makes me all happy, and that is uh, tools. We're going to talk about a lot of tools, tools today, and we're going to figure out a little bit of a workflow, how things uh, work, and some ideas that I have that you might like to think about as well. And then after that, we're going to have our good friend Jason Haddock joining us uh, to do a little bit of an AMA or a conversation around anything. And if you remember that good old TV series, uh, Dr. Frazier, where you call in and ask questions, and you get a smart person answering them, that's going to be Jason. And I'm going to be... Uh, the guy, the guy that's going to be hanging around and trying to yeah, keep up with whatever knowledge come out of his brain. So it's going to be cool. So you better be ready for that and get a little bit about and a little bit of things going. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone that's in the YouTube chat. Mad love to all of you that's tuning in. Thank you, everyone that's in the Twitter spaces. But let's kick it off. So imagine for a second that you're back home and you're... You're sitting around, right? And you're feeling like, mm, maybe I should open up uh, my inbox. And you see that there's this brand new bug bounty or bug bites uh, letter uh, email being sent straight into your inbox. And that's primarily because the nice people over at Integrity put those together. And they're fooled with great information. Pentas Lad is doing a great job. And big, uh, big fan of the organization since they're also sponsoring this show. <laughs> oh, wrong one. And we're super happy about the things that they do for the community. So if you aren't already subscribed to their newsletter, now is a great time to, uh, to sign up for that. And you can do that over at blog.integrity.com. And you'll find a lot of nice stuff in there. Uh, there, there yeah, it's a bunch of news, bunch of news. But maybe, maybe you're in the situation where you feel like, okay, maybe I feel like hacking. Maybe I don't want to hack on integrity. Well, DefParam released a really cool new uh, tool that's called H1 Stats that collects all the information about the, the public programs that are on HackerOne. And over at H1 Stats, uh, the Twitter account, hey, you're going to get, if you follow that, you're going to get... I think almost like daily uh, analytics about how it goes for the different kind of programs, what it pay out and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really, really interesting, the thing that he's, uh, that he's been collecting there. You can see currently like Coinbase apparently seems to have been paid out that huge payout on 250,000. Epic Games is going up a bit. GitLab is also trending on payouts. PayPal is usual or somewhere around 15,000. But that's good. This gives you an idea on maybe what kind of targets you want to hunt on. If they're active and good and making good payouts, your time is important. So maybe this is where you choose that. Okay. Another one that's, uh, and that kind of leads you to the idea that mm, maybe I'll pick a target. Maybe I'll poke around. And the first step we always do is some kind of recon. And the recon master himself in this game, uh, 6 2 is the creator of... Um, Recon for the win um, has uh, written a really good blog post uh, over at Yes We Hack. Uh, that's all about 
tool comparison. You know, MS has been updated lately and some other ones too. So you can use, if you, you would probably dig through this and, and really look into and see the kind of com comparison that they've been doing over there. And you will see all these different tools. You will see all these different uh, uh, flags that are used and, they're, and what kind of word list they're using and all that. Sorry for the crappy resolution here, but you will check that out over at uh, some of the links that I will distribute in a nice way for you later on. I'll actually do a, I'll do a bit of copy and pasta inside the YouTube chat right now. Here you go. Present. Okay. Uh, and when you, once you've done your subdomain enumeration and you're ready to dig deeper into the adventure, maybe you want to get some more data. And... Project Discovery just released this tool called Uncover, which is a, it's a tool that's made to be piped into your automation. So in this case, it will add information from API requests from Shodan, Census, uh, Fofa, and you can add multiple keys in there, and you can, uh, you can pipe things on. So let's say that you wanted to see all the Jira installations on something, you were going to be able to find out what kind of ports they're running. And so. so I think that's really, really cool. I don't have any idea if it's fully functional when it comes to SSL um, queries yet, but for me personally, if I had a possibility to query things for, you know, certificates that was containing organizations kind of name, mm, that would be nice. That would give me a lot of more data and I didn't have to do it kind of manually over at, um, over at Shodan. So you collected all your data and you want to move on to, you know, now it's time to, you have all the subdomains that are active that Hey, that's, they are in scope, so you better get ready to smash those, right? And then there's this one. So some dev released a tool called Euro because you probably like me, you'll do a way back URL or GAO or something. You'll get a bunch and bunch and bunch of endpoints and you don't want to send those straight over to HTTPX or something else and you just hit those all the time. Because if you do that, you're going to end up in a situation where you, you're kind of wasting bandwidth and requests looking for fonts and JPEGs and shit that you, you don't want to have anyway. So this is really cool because it's going to, you're just going to remove all the stuff that are, are not interesting. So, I mean, we, we do not want to have images or maybe JavaScript or something. Maybe I would love to have JavaScript. Hmm. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just, just click JavaScript. That, that seems like a good idea. I'll explain later why, but this is a good way. So you move on to this. So you have all your word list, you're curating it and doing whatever. And then he created another code called Parse. And Parse is also really interesting because this is a heuristic vulnerability scanner. And what it does is that it's going to look for, let's say, all the URLs that you collected uh, from way back URL or whatever, and you're going to end up with a whole bunch of list of, um, of, of parameters and endpoints and stuff. And you, you want to kind of filter out what's interesting and what's useful for you or not. And maybe in, in, in this situation, what we're going to do here is that you know, it's going to show up LFIs or SSRFs or whatever. And, and that is a really, really cool thing to do. And I can hear all of you over in the chat saying, but, but isn't it exactly the same with GF patterns? And I was like, yeah, kind of, but it's a different kind of way to look at it. And I, hey, why just use one tool when you can use both of them, right? And even a third time you can use this in a, it can Haddix has been involved in creating Hunt that kind of does the same thing as well. There's, there's a bunch of tools doing this, but from the CLI line, it's really, really interesting. And if you want to up your game when it comes to DF patterns and you want to find all the redirects or something certain uh, special that you're looking for, hey, check it out. Imad has created this list with a bunch of different patterns that you can go through where people have collected um, different kind of, um, of, of parameters that are useful that may, maybe would give you some information that you would feel uh, would be relevant for the things that, you, that, that you're poking at, right? So, and so now you have all those interesting parameters. So you fly over those and you're super happy. And a bunch of those just turns out to be uh, 403s. So you get super sad. <laughs> super <laughs> you get super sad. But by using don't go uh, by <laughs> devploit, um, you have the possibility to, to dig into finding those 403 that are interesting. And, 
and you can pipe it over to a proxy. So you can get all the ones that hit in the correct way into Burp because we like to put stuff in Burp, don't we? Uh, and what's really interesting with this is that since you have a bunch of payloads here and you can change those, um, you can look for a bunch of headers that would be interesting for the bypasses. Maybe there's going to be some HTTP methods, trying all of those, like brrrm, go through. And the output is going to give you like, okay, all these are 403, but if there's a two, if there's a one single 200 there, that would be interesting for you to dig deeper in. So definitely something that I think you should add into your automation flow. If you haven't already checked out, don't go 403. Uh, maybe, maybe do so. Uh, seems like a good thing to all, add to any kind of automation. We talked about Gao for, for before, and 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 I think that's CDL's tool. And now there's another tool, and it's been around for a while, and it's created by Bipolar. What I really like about Gao Plus uh, versus ordinary Gao is when I'm doing something on VPSs, I normally use it on on hey my my normal kind of Gao, but if I wanted to over proxy chains or whatever, forward things into, once again, my burp, uh, I, I would like to have all the stuff in there and Galblast can do that. There's probably some command line that would solve that for you, but hey, that, that's just how I like to do it. I, I think it's a really interesting tool. So definitely check out that as well. And speaking of automation, the heroes of automation and the ones that kind of changed the game with all that is Project Discovery again. <laughs> um, when they created uh, Nuclei, um, which is a great <laughs> template scanner. But maybe you're sitting in a situation where you, you're running, you collected all these great amounts of templates they have, and even your custom ones that are super cool. You're, you're, you're pumped about it, but you want to run those in Burp. Well, do not fret, my friend. Our great hero, Dabrowski, has created a Burp Club plugin called Nuclei Burp Extensions. And what this does is that you'll take your Nuclei binary and you take your Nuclei templates, you run it on your box, you put it all together, and voila, the things that comes out of that, you're just going to end up as a part of the scanner inside Burp. So you can use your customized templates, now run it through Burp, and vice versa, which kind of leads us to... For Joel's past epic release of what is defined as the nuclear template generator burp plugin. And this is a great tool because if you're you're sitting there, you find this really cool zero day, and you're excited. Well, <clears throat> I just want to fly this all over the place, but you don't want to use your home IP and whatever, so you gotta be a bit uh, cautious. Then you want to be really fast and create the template. Oh, wow, well, well, now, now you can. You just take the request, send it to it, mark whatever uh, you're interested to find to be the match, send it over, voila, you ha now have a nuclei template. You see where I'm going there? Uh, outside burp, in burp, outside burp again. Manual to automation in, uh, in cycles. So that's, that's really cool. Um, I've... Over the years, I develop um, a quite a kind of healthy, but maybe also unhealthy passion to to finding weird stuff in in JavaScript, and I'm so happy that I found this tool by OX Destrius. Oh, I trashed that uh, cool avatar though, which is a tool, uh, which is a plugin for Burp. So it's called Uproot JS. So you can use that in Burp. And then when you spider through all the things, you have all the awesome stuff that you want to have, then you're going to be in a situation where you're like, oh, yeah, no, 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 check this out. I want to have all these JS files uh, outside of Burp and just grep through them and do my stuff. Because to be honest, when you, if you've been running Burp for a while and uh, it's a lot of big JavaScript files in there and you go through those and they're big, sluggish things happen. Um, so you want to play around with those and search and query and regex and shit outside. And this is uh, a useful tool for that because you just right click, say, and then you can just send through it. I really, really like that. Okay, that kind of um, stops the tool segment for now. Uh, remember, you should prepare yourself to call in and get ready to talk to Jason Haddix in a short while. Um, but before we do that, we're going to continue a little bit on with more community stuff. And I, 
wow, this is cool. I, I like that. This is this is how open source community stuff works. So Keenan tweeted, did you know that you can use x55.is to load any JS file inside the domain to achieve XXS? For example, if you domain loads URL plus slash script.js, use x55.is as a URL and get xsx inside that domain. Thanks to Burp Logic for that. I'm like, cool, I like that idea. It's a catch-all, catch-all kind of thing. So if you do a match and replace situation, you can see whatever, if you, and you're replacing whatever domain with your domain, in theory, you could see if it would, would allow you to break out of uh, some kind of XXS uh, thing. Of course, you need to control whatever domain, but it's a good idea to know what you can look for. And I like that idea. So, and, and so I'm, I'm opening that up and I'm happy and I'm like, okay, uh, how, how does it work? So you'll type in like uh, is, is slash stoke.js and then it's going to give you, it's going to supply you with the JavaScript. Any kind of 404 will return you with a valid JavaScript. So any kind of wildcard after whatever you put in will result in an XXS payload, which is cool. And then Rennie steps in and says, ah, oh, it's a bit too long. Have you ever tried to use a really special kind of short domain? And he has registered uh, cm2.tel. And those... That domain uh, can be used with two very specific characters, which means that it's going to be three dot kind of domain. So it's going to be uh, cm2 is one, dot tail is another one. So it's, it's three characters with a dot. Really, really impressive. Hat went off there. So I thought that was really, really cool and smart. <laughs> and, but, but then again, Hey, 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 then we got Frederick Brown step it in. He's like, OE.VC and 14RS are shorter than the 55 one. And the former one is uh, open source and contributions are welcome. And I'm like, cool, we like open source. That means that people can contribute. And just if, if you just head over to that domain, Bob is going to pop your next success and you can use that for whatever you want to do. You can host that on your own server. You can play around with it. There's, there's no big, it's really, really cool, innovative and nice stuff. It's been around probably for ages, but for me, hey, I thought it was cool. So the whole discussion goes on, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, you didn't get it. It's a catch-all and everything. He's like, okay, I get you what you mean. I totally understand it. Bam, now seven hours later, all 403 are now as well working on OE.vc. So if we do fun times here, uh, oh, it's going to read 404 so for anything, it's going to redirect to the straight to the index and bam, you got an XXS again. Love that. That's, that's oh, it's so in innovative when you see that kind of things working and, and it's so fast paced, taking an idea for someone, building on it, boom, we're back again. Yes. Yes, I really, really like that. But now, my ladies and gentlemen, my friends and colleagues, it's time for us to uh, to to um, get Jason on here. So, Jason, could you request being um, a host? That would be sweet. A speaker, maybe, and we can see how that goes. All these nice people are in here, hanging out. All of you, I can see you. All of these nice people are currently in the Twitter spaces, hanging out. Here we go. Jason will now be added as a speaker. Hopefully like that. Hey. Hey, dude. Ready? Let's see if we can get this to work. All uh, right. Can anyone, if you can hear Jason now, can you uh, do a little bit of applaud or something or type something in the chat over at YouTube? Because my YouTube my friends, friend. I need to hear if Jason is audible or not. Hello. I can hear you. You are perfectly sounding clear, my friend. Sounds good. But I want to make sure that, you know, if, uh, if anyone can just li listen into it. Hopefully, that's good. We see what works. Pops and waves in the chat, so yeah. in the We're getting a little bit of waves in the spaces chat. Yep. Okay. We'll see how it works. Maybe we can get some. Uh, may, hopefully, the audio works good as well for the people listening in over at um, over at 
uh, YouTube. <laughs> Hi, Jason, my good friend. It's so good to have you back on the show. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. I'm very, very happy that you're here. And uh, I got a question for you. Uh, we're going to switch into audio only mode right now because we don't know, we don't want to have uh, any kind of music playing in the background for the conversation. And we had a bunch of people uh, enjoying the, the stuff that we had last time. So we're going to start up the way that we left off. Anyone that's interested to having a conversation, asking a question that's bug bounty related, tool rated, methodology related, or anything, uh, please feel free to request as a speaker. And Jason and I will try to do our best to uh, answer your questions. Is that how we're going to do it, Jason? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Perfect. Let me see if I'm able to invite to co host. Send co-host invite. Weird stuff happening. Doing that live. That could be a disaster. But now we're here we are. <laughs> all good. All good. Okay. We got a bunch of people here running in. And uh, it's all good. Let's see if we had any questions coming in through the chat. Uh, maybe. Maybe not. We'll see how it is. I'm going to bump up your audio a bit as well, Jason. So I get, get a good sound in there. Uh, as far as I can see, we're not getting any uh, any questions coming in per usual in the Bounty Thursday live space over at um, over at Twitter Spaces. That's sad, but hey, that's how it is. And let let's see if we can have. Okay, here we go. No, 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 we got none. Varun, here we go. All right, connecting. Greetings, Varun. You are now on Bounty Thursdays Live on air with Jason Haddix and Stoke Frederick. Unmute yourself whenever you're ready and ask your question. My God. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Oh, as much as uh, I am like uh, in, uh, increasing my skills in cybersecurity, uh, we are hearing like um, um, uh, a future of a white hat hackers is in danger like AI or like GitHub code scanning. And now new thing is Web3. Like we are also seeing like new opportunities for hackers. Like, you know, hackers will also need to like pen test like autonomous vehicles, cars and other things. But I heard like Web3 will be very, very much secure. Uh, do you think like, um, I know that uh, in Solidity blockchain and Coinbase bugs are reported and I had understand them. But do you think like Web3 will drastically decrease jobs of white attackers? Not at all. A great question, yeah. Um, what do you say, Jason? It's so funny, it's so funny, Varun, that you asked this question because uh, uh, I just got back from one of the biggest crypto conferences a couple weekends ago. Um, it actually was in my, my home state, uh, Colorado. It was East Denver. Uh, so they have a, a crypto conference here. And so I went with some buddies of mine um, who work at a, you know, a crypto based, uh, currency, uh, company. And I went just to kind of like absorb kind of the web three culture and talk about security with some of the, the people who were there. And I got to tell you, man, I'm not scared, honestly, of losing my job. <laughs> um, the, the reason why is that, uh, you know, when, when you do some research into this stuff, it's like uh, many of the vulnerabilities that the web three space is facing are actually web two vulnerabilities. They're still to do with infra infrastructure architecture. Um, they're still to do with, uh, you know, like authentication and authorization. They're still to do with applications that are the scaffolding around the contract, right? And then there's also a whole new domain of smart contract security, which includes a lot of fraud components. And so, um, you know, just from talking to that ecosystem, it's very young. It's very, uh, you know, that community is very young and they don't, uh, you know, they're not really thinking security first. This is just this is my opinion, by the way, also, like definitely my opinion. They're not thinking security first in a lot of areas. And so um, I don't really feel any job pressure from, or like that we're going to be displaced because of like Web3 or, you know, it's more inherently secure. It still has all the same security problems. And then for AI and ML, I mean, people have been saying that for a long time, that AI and ML and uh, are going to replace and automation is going to replace security testers. And I, in no world do I know many companies 
that are that are not still hiring and hiring frantically for security people right now, right? Like it's just that eventuality has not played out yet. Maybe maybe in the next twenty years, maybe, but um, I'm I'm not worried about either of those spaces right now. I think that we're we're pretty secure as long as you you know you know a domain really well. Um, and someone's going to have to police that technology too, right? Like ML and AI scanning and uh, configuration. And it doesn't just learn. I mean, it can learn by itself, right? But there's parameters you need to feed that technology when it gets um, prevalent that, uh, you know, we'll need experts in that too. So I'm not really worried. Cool. Awesome. Good answer. Hope that gave you an answer, Varun. I removed you as a speaker as uh, we need to move on. Zach, Welcome. You, um, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and join the conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys for having me. I just want to ask a question, a uh, general question here. I was interested in bug bounty. What are the like top three things that I should learn to get started? What do you say about that, Jason? Oh, boy. Um, so when I do like my uh, boot camp for... Um, for new hackers, right? Like, uh, like, you know, I've done a couple of times where I've uh, taken friends through the industry and tried to get them into either bug bounty or security testing, right? I, I take them through a whole bunch of prerequisites that are before even the hacking, right? Like, so having some kind of scripting knowledge, whether it's Python or Go or something like that is, is kind of important. Um, command line familiarity in Linux. So there's a set of Code Academy courses that I can publish the scope that he could put somewhere in the notes or in the description or something like that. And um, you're going to need to have that prerequisite knowledge before you even move into hacking, right? A little bit of knowledge about OSs and things like that. So um, that'd be that'd be the first exact place I would start if you don't already have that tech kind of oriented experience. Um, as far as as hacking, that's like a very general word. It depends on what kind of hacking you're um, you're talking about. Like most people on you know on the show are probably interested in web hacking, which um, you know I think is the most approachable for for many people. Um, and, uh, I always start students off with, uh, with the web application ha hackers handbook, right? It is kind of the Bible for our industry. People say a lot about it's, uh, old or outdated, even version two. Um, but honestly, it, it still describes many of the issues we go through today that are prevalent in AppSec, um, and web, you know, web security. And so, uh, that's, that's where I start the class off is I go chapter by chapter through that book. That, like one class is one topic on the book or maybe two classes are one chapter in the book. And we go over the vulnerabilities uh, from a noob perspective, right? We talk about them very generally, like how they, how they work, why they're an issue. Uh, and then we go into fuzzing for them. Like how do you discover them? And then we go into contextualism. Where do you find them? Right. It's not, I think that's one thing a lot of people miss in especially like, classes or trainings or stuff like that it's like it's like it's, it's very different from a cts when you get into the industry you you look at a cts and you know there's a vulnerability in some field or somewhere on some app right but when you're a tester or you're a bug bounty hunter uh you don't have that um that path you know to know that that's where the thing is and so um we, i spend a lot of time talking about contextually where do these issues often show up and um, i've done a lot of research there and so i guide them through that so the webcation hacker handbook would be like the second thing. And then the third thing is a familiarity with an interception proxy, right? So like burp, so like taking pretty much everything that's on the um, the free burp training or the, the free optic training that uh, Port Swigger does or um, MBSEC, or it used to be MBSEC, now it's Port Swigger, uh, the academy basically, WebSec yeah. Academy. Web, app and, um, web application testing academy or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and then moving through the vulnerabilities there, and you could do that in time with um, you know, with those other resources that I mentioned. So if you can master that, right, you can do all the vulnerabilities, you can use Burp enough to do all the vulnerabilities in that site, you you know the book, you know the underlying technology, it should give you a really good foot um, kind of in the door to looking at, at sites, right? Um, so, you know, and there's so many other tools, like Stoke mentioned so many cool tools today that, you know, you can add on top piece by piece. So just don't try to go too hard, right? It put a lot of pressure on yourself and um, you know, there's been a lot of people lately who have been like, oh, I've been in Bounty for several months and I haven't found anything. And like the common answer to that is that, you know, that, that happens. Like, you know, it even happens even to the pros, right? Pros go dry for six months sometimes. I've, I've, you know, I've heard of other people who are million dollar hackers who haven't found anything in like six months because it's just, uh, you know, it depends on the target you're looking at. It depends on your state of mind. It depends on, you know, your skill set. And so um, don't get too down on yourself and, and just try to go, you know, one step at a time. 
I got a question here in the in the YouTube chat from uh, Nathan uh, that says, and we talked about this last week, but I'll bring it up again because it's always good to just massage that before before we bring on uh, Wayne and uh, and uh, and Bug Bounty Report Explain. So this is the question. I have a question about when you say that you're looking for bugs, would you feel that you would need to move on? Because this is extremely uh, dependent on who you are and what kind of person and what kind of target you're working at. The ebb and flow of bounties, we talked about that before. You are in high season and low season. And sometimes you're excited about something new, sometimes you're not. But what would you say, Jason, is your normal, like what is your go-to kind of selection when it is to looking at a target, how much time can you spend and when do you move on? Uh, I think I answered this in the last one, but uh, I'll answer it again. It's, um, you know, it's usually, it's usually sub two days and for each vulnerability class, it's several hours, right? So, um, you know, if I'm looking for cross-site scripting, the first thing I'm going to do is, is plug a whole bunch of, you know, uh, non-standard characters and see how the, the application is encoding them or, uh, output porting, formatting them. So, um, you know, that'll give me a very quick indication of, you know, like maybe what kind of filters I'm against or is it a common encoding scheme or something like that. So, um, you know, right away I'll know, uh, I'll know, okay, like what they're doing there. And so like this process of like kind of feeling out if something's fishy with that one vulnerability class could take like two hours, right? Like I also want to investigate the server software that they're running and what are the default enabled cross-site scripting filters uh, on that, you know, application, uh, on that application hosting software. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of take all that into account. And if I feel like, hey, they have layered protections here, everything that I've done and I've started fuzzing and sending meta characters in and stuff like that, and it doesn't seem to be coming back with anything um, interesting, then I'll move on from that vulnerability class. Pretty um, sweet. I want to give a shout yeah. out to uh, the Nullcon account that apparently showed up inside the Twitter spaces. That's one of the conferences where you and I met uh, for the first time, Jason. It's uh, yeah. back in 2018. Yeah. Good stuff. Mad love to Nullcon. But we're going to move on. So Wayne, my friend, you are now on the show. And um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, how's it going, guys? All good. Uh First, I want to thank both of you guys. You guys have been a huge, huge help getting into this, uh, you know, bug hunting and everything. You guys, your content has really, really helped out. Um, I wanted to ask, when starting out, you know, would you guys recommend when going into, you know, diving into a web app, would you guys recommend focusing on, you know, your your, your strongest vulnerability that you know you, you can find and you know pretty well or should you be more of a Swiss Army knife and kind of, you know, look for everything? Uh, or is it better to focus on one and really attack that through all the different endpoints? Thank you, Wayne, for your question. I'm going to uh, remove you as a speaker and we're going to answer the question now. Uh, it's all, it's all depends. I mean, for me personally, I have a certain kind of amount of bugs that I like to look for. And my brain just automatically just pokes that kind of... Uh, indicators or payloads that would that, that that would influence me or inspire me to go deeper and see if it's uh, you know what kind of framework is it how do things communicate do they have i'm more or less following following some kind of methodology that's not really fully defined but i do have one uh, how about you jason um you know i i definitely have bugs that i'm better at right um there are there are some bugs that you know, some of the million dollar hackers are really good at that I'm I'm not good at. And uh and, and it doesn't mean I can't find them or I haven't exploited them before in like TTS or something like that or in trainings, but um you know, everybody has their specialty. So, you know, my general approach is focus on your specialty but don't let don't leave the rest of the application uncovered. Um, you know, my personal view on this is, is very uh is very deeply held by myself. I am not afraid of sending traffic to a bounty target usually, right? Um, so if, if I know my set of bugs that I'm really good at, right? Like author authorization, authentication issues. I'm like decently good at cross-site scripting. I'm pretty good at injection. Um, you know, most types of injection, like I'm pretty good at those. So, um, you know, like everything else that's in the vulnerability classes, I will not hesitate to scan with some automation, right? Whether that means burp scanner or that means, 
you know, a nuclei template to check for like CVE level misconfigurations or stuff like that. Um, I'm not, I'm not afraid to do that just to inform me that, Hey, there might be something weird here. And then I'll use my skill set to, um, to go chase that down if there's like an alert. And, um, I know that a lot of people really frown towards, you know, using any type of automation or stuff like that. But it's been my experience testing enterprise level websites for 15 years that like, there's a lot of space to cover on a website, right? Like there are hundreds, you know, sometimes thousands of parameters and paths and endpoints that you can have on an enterprise level application. Um, there's API endpoints, there's, you know, there's nested stuff, there's the way parsers work and break down files that you upload. There's just so much in any enterprise. And this is why you find bounties that have been open for years and years and they still have vulnerabilities, right? So mm. um, there's so much that I have no problem using some automation to cover the stuff that I'm not explicitly really, really good at. And are you, just to get clear here, because I'm I'm on the other end. I'm extremely careful. Yeah, but yeah, but no, then again, yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm, and I wish I was kind of that. Uh, I wasn't that scared, but you know, I got mad WAF blocked too many times, and I, <laughs> yeah, I think it's so yeah. so hard to move around. But but um, would you would you say that you had you have spider target? You crawled everything. You're good. Would you just like control A? send to active scan and just blow through everything? Would you do that? No. So it's a measured approach, right? So I create a custom burp profile mm. for the things I'm talking about that like I'm not good at, right? Yes. And so it's it maybe only six or seven of the total scan checks that burp normally runs. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also using um, some custom extensions as well that uh, implement themselves through the scanner. And so, uh, yeah, so maybe six or seven things, and I, I try to limit it that way, right? Like, and then the things I know that, you know, I'm usually not good at or, or cool. whatever. Um, one of my favorite ones is backslash powered scanner. Mm -hmm. um, Paraminer? Uh, is that something you uh, yeah. let, let free? You just send away with the whole asset node list? <laughs> no, <laughs> that one's not. Uh, that one is not. Uh, although I do do a lot of content discovery outside of birth, right? So I'm using... Uh, FUF or uh, FUF, whatever you want to call it, but, um, you know, um, to, to do content discovery. Content discovery is actually like a really interesting topic because like, if you look at how people stumble upon bugs, mm. you know, like I, I haven't done any scientific research about this, but many times it's discovered via content discovery, via directory brute forcing. Yeah. Like the endpoints that they find the issues are, are, you know, not really spider like I mean, they are many times spidered, but like uh, I would be interested to see the percentage of like how many times they found a vulnerable endpoint via content discovery versus just you know spidering the site. Usually, those those less traveled places that end up having vulnerabilities. So. Definitely, and that's what I told in the beginning in, in the opening talk is that why why I love to crawl uh, um, JS files and and go back even yeah. you know capturing yeah. old JS files and dis diffing out that in using. Uh, there's a tool. Uh, that can grab historical data uh, out of Wayback Machine. I can't remember it, but I use that to just download everything and then just grip through that, create a custom word list that I then eventually just, I, I stick it into Burp and I, and just run it through as as using Intruder or something as an authenticated user and then do that as an, as an unauthenticated and see what kind of hits I get back. It, it's directly yeah. brute forcing, but using the kind of thing that they already have. And it's also great to slice those up using Unfurl or whatever if you're doing API brute forcing. Franz Rosen is really, really technically skilled at this. More or less some kind of pitch for cluster bomb, right? You're like replacing everything and eventually you see monk something comes out because the skill set in this is finding the anomalies, understanding what yeah. sticks out. Uh, and that takes time and, and, and things. Okay, we're moving on to the next question. Uh, time is running out. We got about 15 more minutes, then we're going to give it a go. So, my friend, Bug Bounty Report Explained, you are on Bug Bounty Thursday Live Air. Uh, wait, 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 on air. <laughs> Ask your question. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, Jason, you said that uh, from those bugs related to good stock changes, most of them are still web to vulnerability. Do you think it's more because just more people look for web to stuff because more people know web to stuff? Or do you think that, you know, smart contracts, there are, let's say, less things that can go wrong? What do you think? With smart contracts? Like question. Yeah. yeah, with smart contracts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so I won't, I'm not, I don't want to frame myself as an expert in this space because I'm still learning, right? It's like, uh, He's not an it's expert. so new. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's it's so new, and um, and I have some very big enthusiast friends in the crypto scene, so I'm not um, like they're probably more knowledgeable. Than me. Right? There is a lot of security vulnerabilities that show up um, still in that space. Uh, the question is, is it more because less people have the skills to test it or is it more because there's, there's just more in the web 2.0? Um, I'm, I'm just going to go out and say it's my personal opinion that I think that, uh, that it's not the first, thing, right? So, um, there are many bug bounty hunters, and many crypto enthusiasts and other people who are looking at smart contracts and the exchanges and, um, and the protocols and everything surrounding and the scaffolding around uh, that stuff. And um, they're really skilled hackers and the technologies are a little bit more inherently secure, you know, in the blockchain. So it's not that there's not the skills yet to test it. I think that people are just forgetting about the last 10 years of application security in the scaffolding around these, these things. And so that's, that's my personal opinion. Um, you know, many other you know, people will have different opinions, but that's that's kind of my, my personal take. Uh, just from from being around the uh, the conference I went to this weekend, and having looked at the disclosures um, the disclosures that have been done uh, for big hacks of uh, these ecosystems. So, yeah. Pretty cool. Thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, Bug Bounty Repos Explained, thank you so much for all the great stuff you do. Uh, do you want to pitch your YouTube channel real quick? Thanks, uh, of course. First of, of all, thanks for, for organizing this space. I was thinking about similar things, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, so go, let me uh, pitch my channel. So everyone, if you want to see advanced bug bounty reports explained on YouTube uh, in a simple way, check out bug bounty reports explained uh, channel. I'm right now. <laughs> I'm right now preparing the video. Will be up next Monday, so I'll make sure to subscribe. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, have a good one, and I'll see you around. Okay, we got another speaker here, and that would be... Oh, he dropped off, so I'm going to add this one instead. Add speaker, uh, Oli. Oi, <laughs> you're now on. Welcome. Oi. <laughs> hey, guys. Hi, sir. Hi, Tazen. Hi. Hey. Hi. One thing, um, a lot of integrity programs is now adding stuff like apps, this custom header with your username yep. and add another one, use this agent and the rate yep. limit. Rate limit makes totally sense to me, mm -hmm. but adding the username to some extra headers for all of the tools you're using is sometimes a little bit tricky. Maybe you can run all through Burp and add these extra headers, but it's not always possible. So now I'm asking you, are you always adding these special headers like it's required for the program or are you just checking the rate limit and how do you handle this? Is there a, a special tool which edit or how can, the thing is, how do you handle this request? Good stuff. Good question. I'll answer that first uh, because I'm, I'm mostly using, depends on the target. If I'm hacking on the target that requests that, it's usually either um, during a live, live hack uh, event or it's something that uh, they really want to know what's happening, right? And, and you want to be nice to to send that, and it's all good for you. You know, you can if you're adding that, you can always argue that check your logs. I was first. What, what do you mean about this dupe? You can see the request coming in. But yeah. what I do is I I do simple match and replace rule in Burp. That's what I do. And if I'm doing FFUF, if I'm do, doing any kind of discovery stuff that re evolves like HBX or something, I'm adding okay. my header. That's that's what I do. It's like I have it as a parameter. I just smash it in. Okay, and if you do automatic uh, scan. Then Through you add that too. Okay. Jason, how do you do it? Yeah, so one of the things I promised Stoke was I'd be pretty honest um, and raw on this podcast, right? So I'm, I'm going to be pretty honest and raw, right? Like 90% of the times, yeah, I honor, I honor the header request. But when it is a giant pain in the ass for my tooling to add the header request, whether I'm like proxying a VPN, then through a burp instance to add the header, or the tool doesn't have the ability to add the header, Sometimes I go without, and uh, the the way I've done that before is I just sent in a submission to the program that was blank and said, "Hey, listen, I had this tool. I needed to run it for this reason. Um, if you can NA this report, that would be great. You know, not applicable or whatever, or just like you know, nuke the report. But I'm just letting you know here's my IP that the scan is coming from. Um, but I couldn't get this tool to add a custom header 
or it was, you know, prohibitive to the, the time sensitive nature of the bounty starting. Um, in 99% of the time, the platform has been like, yeah, okay, cool. We understand we have an app tech team. It's a pain in the ass to add this stuff. We know like whatever. So, um, that has been in the cases where I can't or it's too much work, um, do it. I, I approach it. Cool. We got a uh, room for one more question and it's going to be 50, 50 between, uh, half is and green. So, um, you, do you want to Rochambeau on that? I'll do okay. <laughs> Jason, right. Jason, pick yeah, a speaker. Yeah. Pick a speaker. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, we have uh, two. I'm gonna do any mini mini mo like my son does. Now we got hacks blamed on too. So can, too. That's a good. All right. Uh, we had someone drop off. So ha yeah. Hafiz, Hafiz it is. Yeah. Yes. So I'll add Hafiz. Add as a speaker. <laughs> I'll add Hacksplain as well, and you can just idle around. That's going to be the last one. So, Hafiz, uh, Hafiz, you are now on air. Welcome. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, thanks oh. for having me. Hi, hi Stuck. Hi, Jason. Uh, question to Jason, quick one. Um, we all know your your um, recon methodology, right? And I recently, mm -hmm. thanks a lot for that amazing research, by the way. I recently used it in one of my videos. I was just curious, um, how many times are you updating that? When, when, do you, when are you realizing that it might be a little dated? And when do you think the, the next version is coming out? Yeah, that's a pretty common question. So, uh, whenever you go to a conference and has... need to speak, right? Isn't that how it is? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's like whatever I want to, really. But, uh, you know, the, the real answer is that, like, you know, through COVID and everything like that, and I'm a, I'm a dad of three kids, so I have a lot of stuff going on, and I, I have a full-time job. Um, I haven't been updating the recon methodology, or um, I have promised several times to do the, the like general app hacking uh, second part of the talk, which is more into like what you do when you're on a single website as opposed to doing recon to find targets. It's so, the ultimate um, cliffhanger to have you not release that. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. I know. I know. I know everybody wants it, right? Like, uh, I know. Uh, I know everybody wants it. So Here's the you know, map. There's no loot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping this. Oh, excuse me. I'm hoping this year. Um, I'll get to I'll it. help you I'll out if you need time. it. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, you know, it's just one of those things where I sat down to do it a couple times, and um, you know, I'm always iteratively collecting the data, right? Like I'm always on Twitter. I'm always looking at disclosures. I'm trolling GitHub for new tools. That's just what I'm always doing, and I'm bookmarking them and I'm reading them. Same thing that Stoke does for Bounty Thursdays, right? And so that's to keep me fresh in my own hunting and like, um, and so yeah, my methodology evolves when I decide to create a, you know, a PowerPoint deck and a presentation and give it to the world is just like when I can find that space. And there just hasn't been a lot of space in the last couple of years due to COVID and everything else. So um, I promise it's on my mind. I promise I will get to it eventually, but uh, it's just been uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, so you just have to wait. Sure. <laughs> it's going to show up. Okay, last one. Yeah. Hafiz Aziz, my friend, you are now live on uh, Bounty Thursday uh, Spaces. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, Jason. Hi, Stok. Hi. Hello. So, so I, um, I, I find bugs on Android. I, I actually hack on Hacker One, and I'm working on a CTF for bug bounty hunters using the Android platform. Cool. I'm just interested to know what kind of um, resources would you send me to, to get more information regarding Android hacking? Oh, dude. And what kind of CTFs can, can, I, can I use to learn more on Android, Android hacking? I'm, I'm going to be totally brutally honest here and say I have no idea because I don't hack on Android. Uh, but if there's anyone that has any ideas that are in this Twitter space or in um, anywhere around on the chat or so, uh, feel free to uh, look Hafiz up and look for that. But I'm going to remove you, Hafiz, and add Jason to see if we can answer it. Yeah, so actually right. mobile, was, uh, mobile was a field that... I was really in, um, in fact, I was one of the co-authors of the mobile top 10 on OWASP. And so, um, I, yeah, I was really, I was really in the mobile many years ago when it was brand new. Um, I have since kind of fallen off and not done a ton in the mobile space, but, um, there is a repo called awesome mobile CTF on GitHub. And it has something like maybe 
close to 100, maybe a little bit more than 100, actually CTF challenges that are related to Android and iOS and mobile APIs. So, um, you know, if you're trying to instruct people or, like, you know, give them things to, like, practice mobile hacks on, um, you know, that would be the place where I would start. Um, it also includes, a, you know, like the repo list, all of the, um, all of the tools that you can use and frameworks that you can use. Uh, it goes over, you know, simple guides to jailbreaking, et cetera, et cetera, um, for mobile, right? A lot of Android stuff, actually, it's mostly Android stuff because it tends to be that iOS is a little bit harder of an ecosystem to break into. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, there's a lot of resources in, in, in the CTF world to, to hack mobile stuff. So I would start there to give them targets. As far as like, as far as like, uh, learning material, I'm not sure what the best learning material right now for, uh, mobile hacking. I haven't really kept, kept up for it. Um, but, uh, maybe the chat can help us out here. And like, it, the thing about like the mobile, mobile learning material for like how to hack mobile apps, right? Is, is that it, it goes stale pretty fast. Like the tools and techniques are like, like they, they basically get out of date really quickly. The jailbreaks don't work anymore. The, the instrumentation, um, is, you know, not active anymore. Um, uh, the project doesn't get maintained if it's a framework to, to hack all this stuff or some educational content. So, um, yeah, I'm not really sure what the best is right now, but, uh, that would be where I'd start. Well, it's not like SQL injection and XXEs that's been around early twenties and early on. <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it's just a different kind of uh, sandbox to break out of anyway cool uh that sums it up for today everyone that joined this awesome it sounds kind of hard to say awesome but jason uh will we be back again in another two weeks yeah another two weeks make it a regular thing then we'll go back here so you better get ready to get back here on that would be, let's see the date here. I'm going to figure out the date for all of you. We will be back again on Thursday, the 17th of March in the Twitter space and also live on YouTube for you to be both updated on the cool stuff that I found online and also, you know, pick Jason's brain. And uh, don't be shy. It's going to be all fun and games from here. So uh, with that said... Thank you all for listening in and I hope that I will see you again. In